So, moving things beyond just the basic technical fundamentals that I've covered in so much depth over the past few months, let's start to talk about lighting. Now, what I've got for you is an entire lighting course that used to be behind a paywall, but now I'm gonna release it chapter by chapter every week on this YouTube channel. So why is light so important to photography and why do I think it's so important to learn about lighting and how it works? Well, of course, on a very simple basic level, without light, you can't have any photographs at all. But beyond that, understanding how light works and therefore mastering it and being able to use light better in your photographs will improve how they look no matter what type of photography you're into and no matter what you shoot. Great light takes your photographs to another level. The fantastic thing about light, once you understand it, is that the principles apply no matter what type of light you're shooting in. The same principles I'm going to take you through apply to daylight natural light, they apply to flash, they apply to very clever modern things like LEDs, they apply to flow tubes, torches, it doesn't matter. The principles are universal, and as with so many great things about photography, once you've got the principles in mind, you can then manipulate those to suit your ends. You don't have to get caught too much in the specifics. Just get those basic principles really well ingrained, and you'll have a toolkit that will last you the rest of your photographic career. Understanding how light works in photography is about more than just photographic technique. It's also about learning to see light. I'd highly recommend you start looking at more photographer's work, particularly work where lighting is a key part of it. And the same goes for other visual artists. Also keep your eyes open in the real world, situations where light is particularly dramatic or inspiring. I'd also recommend you try and keep some kind of log or journal that you gather together work and imagery that inspires you and make notes of lighting at particular times of day in particular situations. And gradually you'll start to incorporate this in your work. In this course, I'm also going to take you through the process of reverse engineering. This is a system whereby you can look for the clues in an image that will tell you how the image was created, and through those, you can then recreate aspects of it yourself and incorporate them into your own work. So let's get started with a quick overview of the four basic characteristics that all light has. Doesn't matter what the light source is, maybe daylight, flash, LED, doesn't matter. All light will have a direction, a quality, a quantity, and a colour. Those are the four basics. There are lots and lots of little nuances amongst them, as you can probably imagine, and the four are interrelated in all sorts of ways. But the great thing about light is that once you've got your head around those four basic characteristics and how they work, with a bit of careful thought, you can work out how to light pretty much anything. Now, you may not, of course, have the time and the budget to light simply anything, but at least with the underlying knowledge, you can look at all sorts of situations and decide, OK, I can change that aspect, I need to change that, I can adjust to that, I can work around that, I can bring things in here, and create the look that you're after. All of which will make your photography much, much better and create much more impressive images. Let's get stuck in. All light, no matter what source you're using, will have four characteristics. Direction, quality, quantity, and color. Now those are my terms for it. You sometimes hear different terms used to express the same thing. For example, quantity is often called intensity, but it amounts to exactly the same thing. Don't get too worried about that. The main thing I want to keep stressing, and this won't be the first time I've said this and it won't be the last, is that whether you are using a flash gun, whether you are using the light from a table light, whether you are using the light from a massive great tungsten head, whether you are using the LEDs from a head torch, it doesn't matter. All the light will have a direction, a quality, a quantity, and a colour. And you can't escape that. Okay, of course, once you understand what, how each light fits into these four categories and how perhaps if using more than one light source, how they all fit together, you've got the keys to the kingdom. And you can make perfect sense of any light, you can work around almost any situation you're faced with, hopefully. Now, starting with direction of light. I always like to start here because it's so obvious it's often overlooked. It, of course, where the light is coming from is absolutely critical, but it's so basic that we just sometimes don't even think about it. Uh, if you're outside on a bright sunny day, the direction the light is coming from is going to be where the sun is. Okay, 
easy, but you've got to bear that in mind depending on what you want from your shot. Of course, if it's a light you're introducing to the scene, say a flash gun, the direction is arguably up to you. Um, direction matters a great deal because, of course, where the light is falling on something and therefore where the shadows are will affect how the shot feels. For example, we have got very accustomed to light coming from above because that's where the sun is. So when you walk into a room, rooms are generally lit from above. Um, it's very natural to us to see shadows under here and under here rather than the other way around. If you light somebody from underneath, it's not very flattering. So the direction is very, very important. Now, of course, direction will often limit what you can do if it's a light you can't move, such as the sun. You might have to come back a different time of day or might need to move the subject. Direction can also impact upon quantity of light and quality of light. For example, the sun on a cloudless day is a very, very hard light source. The quality of it is very hard. But in fact, it's an enormous thing when you think about it. It's just that it's very, very far away. And of course, direction is also related to distance, you know, not, not just where it is, but how far away from you is it. And the fact that it's so huge but so far away means that, relative to us, it's become very, very small, and because it's small, it casts a hard light. Something much closer, of course, not only becomes larger in relation to the subject, therefore creates a, a softer light, but of course, the closer it is, the more there is of it. Okay, we, we've all seen examples of this. If you take a, a, a simple torch like this and you aim it off into the distance, well, you can't really see things way off in the distance, but if you bring your hand up, your hand is brightly lit, as more of the lights get scattered through the atmosphere more of the light gets dispersed. So direction and distance, which are very, very closely related, are absolutely crucial. Okay, and the two are interrelated and they also will tie into the other factors as well. Next, light will always have a quality. Now this quality will be somewhere on a sliding scale from incredibly soft and diffused to very, very hard and focused light. That's it, that's all there is to it. It'll, it'll be soft, hard, or somewhere in between. There's a multi, multi million pound industry out there that sells photographers ways of making light fit somewhere on this scale. Okay, modifying the lights you've got. But it's still just the same scale. And the light can't be more than one thing at once. It can only be somewhere on the scale. It can't be here and here. It's not possible. We are, again, used to certain things. Just like we're used to light coming from above and, and shadows underneath being natural, we are used to certain types of light, certain qualities of light being more natural to us. Softer light, for example, it tends to be more flattering. Softer light tends to suit, say, beauty images better. Harder light, by comparison, will show up texture more. Okay, so there are underlying codes that are in place in terms of how we use light and what we expect to see, which obviously, like any sort of code or rule of thumb, you can employ them, but you also know when to break them. Sometimes doing a beauty shot with very hard light can look stunning and vice versa. There are many, many ways you can change the quality of light. You can be outside on a bright, sunny, cloudless day with a very, very hard light of just the sun beating down on somebody. You can make that light soft by simply moving under the shade of a tree and now your subject is in what's called open shade. The light around them will be so much softer. You can take a hard light source like something like this flash gun and you can bounce it off a white ceiling so that now rather than the source of light being this size the source of light is probably six feet square as it bounces off the white ceiling above you. You can also put diffusion material between the light source and yourself. You can take shower curtains, you can buy expensive photographic versions and you can hold them up in front of the sun and between the sun and your subject and it will soften the light falling onto them. There are lots and lots of ways you can alter the quality of light. You can also take a big soft light and you can block sections of it off so that only a small channel is hitting somebody and the light itself becomes harder. But don't forget, quality consists of nothing more of being very, very soft or very, very hard and it'll be somewhere on this line. The only other thing to bear in mind with quality, as I mentioned briefly when talking about direction, is it's also actually due to relative size. Generally speaking, a soft light will be large in relation to the subject it's lighting, and a hard light will be small in relation to the subject it's lighting. But of course, if you move something much closer in relation to, in relation to the subject, that is now larger, so it becomes a softer light, and vice versa as you take it further away. So sometimes all you need to do to make a light, say, softer, is, as I've said, take something small and make the actual light source larger by bouncing it off something, diffusing it through something. 
Relative size can be enough to change the quality. The quantity of light you've got to play with is also critical. Now, in some ways, light direction, it's often so obvious that it's overlooked. We totally understand that if you go outside on a bright sunny day, there will be a lot of light around. And if you come inside into a room lit by a dim 60 watt bulb, there's not much light around. So it's so obvious we just don't even take it into account. Now, hopefully you've done my technical foundations course and you understand the basics of exposure. So what you'll appreciate is that, of course, the amount of light there is, is going to affect your choices of shutter speed, aperture and ISO. Now, of course, nowadays, as we know, you can vary these an awful lot. You've got a lot of range to play with an ISO and you can adjust it from shot to shot. And you might have a lens that's got an enormous aperture range and a camera with a huge range of shutter speed. So you might think, well, I can deal with any light coming. Probably, but bear in mind things like trying to freeze motion, for example. Let's say, you know, for the shot you're trying to get, you're trying to freeze somebody jumping in midair. Well, if you think about it, you need a fast shutter speed for that. And if you want to get quality images rather than stuff with lots of noise in, you want a fairly low ISO. And if you want them to be nice and sharp with a little bit of depth of field, you also want to stop the aperture down a bit. That's going to mean you need a lot of light. And that might be a problem, <laughs> okay? So the quantity of light there is may limit your creative choices or may force you into certain areas. Quantity might also affect what I like to think of as your production choices. So your choices for how you organize a shoot. So you might have, you know, say flash guns to play with, or you might have great big main studio lights. The power of one may way overpower the other. For example, if you're, if you're in a, an interior setting and you're trying to capture the mood that you would get from something, I mean, that, that's a, one of the little uh, energy saving bulbs that puts out a tiny amount of light. That's being massively overpowered by a two kilowatt tungsten light up there. Okay, and the same would happen if I brought a great big powerful mains flash pack in to try and light me, I would lose the output from that because the relative quantities are so far apart. You know, that is putting out very little light and a big mains flash pack would put out lots of light, as is that two kilowatt light. Tied into this, of course, is practical issues of how portable these things are. This same light that's lighting me right now is only mains powered. And whilst two kilowatts of a tungsten light like that is very powerful indoors here in my flat, it's nothing against the midday sun, I can assure you. So if I was trying to light with those sort of lights outside on a bright sunny day, I'm on a hide into nowhere. So quantity is something you can't escape. Like I say, all light has those four facets. Let's just quick review them again in case you've forgotten. Direction, quality, quantity, and color. And it's very easy to overlook quantity, particularly if you come from a background where you've only used automatic exposure, just snapped away on a camera phone, and it's taken care of all the quantity for you because it just gives you an exposure. Bearing in mind it's something you can't escape, you must tie it into how exposures are put together and get the exposure you want. Now lastly, we have the color of light. This is something that's a bit hard to go into much detail in just an introduction like this, so I'll be, I'll be as explicit as I can without trying to confuse you, but all light has a color. It fits on what's called the Kelvin scale. Now if you've again done my technical foundations course, you'll have seen the Kelvin scale. That's, that's the white balance color temperature thing. Okay, remember that goes from orange down this end all the way through to blue at this end. Okay, with numbers ranging from sort of 2000 up to 10,000. Each light can, apart from a very few rare exceptions, each light can only be one color. And a camera can only record one color at once. The white balance it is set to, the color temperature it is set to, will only be one. Now, if you're dealing with just one type of light, you're outside in daylight or you're just using flash, or you're just using tungsten lights, let's say, you haven't got a problem because you set your camera white balance to match the type of light you're in, your photos will look right. They won't look too orange, too blue, or have weird color casts in them. If you start to mix light sources, you might have a problem. You certainly have a problem if you're trying to get a nice even set of colors rather than having bits over here that are orange, bits over here that are blue. With things like architectural photography, for example, this can be really, really critical. You know, you, nobody wants their fantastic brand new building to have weird color washes across it when it's not supposed to. It's all supposed to be one unified color. You can, of course, use this creatively, as we'll come on to later with lighting. You can use things called color gels, which are basically bits of transparent plastic with color casts to them that will change the color output of your light from one end of the scale to the other. But the important thing to remember is that all light does have a color, and your camera can only record one color temperature, one white balance at once. So you might need to bear in mind that if you've got different sources to play with, you're going to need to alter them, alter them in some way and account for the fact that one is coming in very orange compared to what you're set for, or one is coming in very blue. 
Right, those are the four basics covered in the fastest, simplest way I possibly can. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to take you through each of those four facets in more depth, because as I keep stressing over and over again until you're sick of hearing me say it, if you understand these basic principles, everything else is just detail. Okay, once you've got your head around what these four things do, direction, quality, quantity, and color, you'll be set. Trust me.